Excellent. So we're here with Shannon Wooten. Now Shannon is a life coach. She is a writer. She is a public speaker. She is a teacher, a project manager. She is a two-time author. She is the author of a book that I cannot get enough of at the moment, Infertility Sucks, You Don't. And she struggled with, or is struggling currently, is struggling with fertility and on this for six and a half years, which is just absolutely amazing. But she has made something of it, which is why we are all here. And Shannon, if I can hand it over to you and you can tell us just a little bit about you and your fertility journey. Hello, everybody. I cannot see the question. So I'm going to rely on our friend Jennifer here to kind of share, as she said before, anything that comes up. So don't feel like I'm, you're not seeing something. It's not poignant to me. It's not important. It's all relevant, important. You are important. You matter. Thank you for being here with us. And I just want to say before I go into anything about me, I see you. I feel you. How you feel about whatever you're going through is important. It is valid, it is yours, and it matters. So we love you and we thank you for being here with us. I'm so honored, Jennifer, thank you for inviting me to engage in this conversation. She knows um, through all the preparation that she's done on the front end of this, which has been huge and it's such a marvel to watch anybody throw their heart into something so passionately. And I think it speaks leaps and bounds about who Jennifer is as a person. I'm sure everybody here can testify to that. She is just heart-centered and this is what led us all to be here because of who she is. So thank you. Thank you. And this is the very, I mean, that, that beautiful introduction. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for reading my book. And thank you for all of the pages of notes that you showed me. You have little post-its on. That means a lot to me because when you speak out and you speak out um, about something that is, when you speak out about something, period, right? That's a big feat in and of itself. But first and foremost is to have that moment of reckoning and recognition with yourself that this matters to me. That's massive. So for any of you that are here with us and you have a feeling or an inkling or an idea about anything, I just want you to take a minute to recognize how, can I swear here? Yes. Okay. I swear, if you don't know me, you're going to get to know me intimately today. Um, but how fucking massive that is. It is, it is coach rule numero uno that 10% of what we do in our change and our transformation with ourselves is actual action. 90% is noticing, is developing awareness. So for you to have any sort of awareness about how you actually feel in this moment, not that you're firm or confirmed in that belief, just an inkling of, I think I may be feeling this, or I think this may be what I'm experiencing in that moment. Just that awareness is huge, massive. And so for me to have that own awareness for myself took me four years to get to that place. Four years of having the awareness of, do I feel this way? Am I struggling with this? Have I just shrunken myself down into a soundbite of the culmination of my entire life is about fertility? It took me four years just to get there. It took me another two years to write that book and publish it. So just to give you a frame of reference, it wasn't like I woke up one day and was like, oh, I feel all these things. Um, I missed all of the doctor's appointments, the incessant and persistent doctor's appointments, the drugs that I had to take, the surgery that I had to experience, the time sexual encounters that my husband and I had to undergo in order to attempt to conceive, the every single day of poking and proding and analyzing and reducing myself to a soundbite of you can't and yet you want to, and you're struggling through it, that took many, many years of getting to that place. So if you're in a place where you're beating yourself over the head right now, and you're making yourself feel awful about it, and I say that intentionally, you are making yourself feel awful about it, I know that swallowing that down is like swallowing a machete. It's awful. It hurts your heart. And it also hurts to feel that I think this way about me, and therefore I'm doing that to me. So know that this didn't just happen for me overnight and that I still struggle with this. I still have moments where I think uh, everything is easy breezy and I'm going through my life like this doesn't bother me anymore. And then I find out that someone close to me is pregnant and I'm like, oh, and it's not that I'm not happy for them. 
because I'm sad for me that this is my life, that this is a part of it. But, and I'm sure we'll get into it, it is not all that I am. And it does not define me. It is a part of my experience. It is a part of my journey. And it is also one of the things that has allowed me to see who I am, that I get to decide what this means to me, and that this does not get to define me. And it doesn't do any of those things for any of you watching either. And I think that's really hard as well. So you talk about, and I, I am going to quote a lot in this book, because as you said, I have made sticky notes, but at what point did you get to, because you talk in your book and you're very open about it, you know, from when you, from your endometriosis and all of these different things that kind of came up. And then you spoke of this point that you got to where you realized that you were, you were contemplating suicide. So can you just walk us through, you know, how you got to that point where you were sitting in that room? And can you explain to us kind of the, the awakening that happened at that point in time? Yeah, sure. Um, first and foremost, it's always very surreal to hear somebody quote you back. Um, and I hope that I never get too big for my britches, that it feels the way it feels, you know, like that's my intention. So thanks for that. Thanks for reading again. Thanks for ingesting it and letting it be impactful to you and meaningful to you that you can actually quote it. That means a lot to me. So thank you. Um, yeah. So as I mentioned, it wasn't a short journey for us. And when I say journey, cause it's still ongoing, right. I'm, I'm, I'm in my thirties. I'm 36 years old. Like I am not in a, in a stage of my life where I'm going to go through menopause anytime soon. Um, and at least I haven't. So I'm still in, you know, what they consider the fertile years of my life. Mm -hmm. But at the time, um, it was about three, three or four years into it, um, where I actually started to deteriorate, not only mentally, because I could see myself um, going through patterns and behaviors that were not normal for me, where I was like drinking a bottle of wine every night, just to cope with myself in my existence. Um, and I was crying every day, you know, uh, at the time I was only a project manager. That was my primary profession. And, and I wasn't a writer or doing any of these things, life coaching, nothing. And I would, you know, in between meetings, go to the bathroom and cry in the bathroom stall. That's not normal for me. You know, I was having these outbursts on people where I was being really hateful and what I call going for the jugular, I was going for the thing that I thought would really wound them. Of course, later in retrospect, seeing that it was because of how wounded I was. Um, I was having this expectation of everybody to understand exactly what I was going through and to not cater to me, but cater to me. And, and it's funny you say that, you know, we have this expectation that people will just be able to comfort us and we we expect them to say the right thing to do the right thing but in reality there is no right thing we don't even know what makes us feel good or the, what would comfort us but we expect that and we place that on other people and and you know there's so much talk about insensitive comments and the triggers and things like that but you do also mention in your book that you need to give them some race as well and show empathy for them because they're just trying and they just want to help you and fix you whereas I think when someone says something and they don't comfort you in how you need to be comforted in that moment because it changes so much that right. you you direct your anger and your frustration at them rather than showing them empathy first that they're just trying to help you. Yeah. And, you know, I would encourage you if, if what Jennifer just said there really resonates with you is to identify what right or wrong means anyways. What does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it became very apparent for me because I was also in a conflict between, and I'll, you know, as I'm saying all this, please check in for yourself where this resonates with you and where it's maybe even triggering with you, where you want to be like, fuck her and log off. 
And I encourage you to challenge yourself to stay on and keep going because there's a reason that there's this is challenging for you and triggering for you. And it could be that there's some, some truth in it for you does not have to be the same as mine or Jennifer's or anybody else's in your life. It's an invitation when you have a trigger to go in on that thing, to go in on that thing and find out what is it about that thing that's triggering me. You don't need to solve for it. Just see it. Remember what I said at the beginning, noticing it, noticing it before you take the action, just see it. And so I was in this, this combat with the combat with juxtaposition of myself of who I had known myself to be is this strong, self-dependent, self-sufficient, independent, you know, resilient woman versus this woman that felt like broken, barren, and I didn't even know who the fuck I was. I remember looking myself in the mirror and being like, who are you? I couldn't even stand the sight of myself. And I remember it was a, it was a series of events that led up to the moment where I thought, I know why people kill themselves. And it started obviously by understanding that, having that moment where my doctor had said to me, this may, may be difficult for you to see and just kept building and layering and layering on top of itself. But when I became really present and aware of it was when my brother and my sister-in-law were pregnant and they were having a baby shower. And at the time, my husband ran his own business. I mean, he still does, but a different business. And so he was not able to attend the event. So I went by myself, my whole family was there, but by myself without my armor, right? Without my husband. And every single time there was some sort of comment or question about when are you gonna have children? I find myself at the bar drinking another drink. Later on that evening, my father was driving us, and as we were driving home, there was a comment made that made me feel like he was saying to me, get over it. When are you going to get over it? And I broke down. I broke down in uncontrollable sobbing, and it was a mess. It was such a mess where I, I couldn't make heads or tails of, why do you feel this way? You're actively choosing this. You're actively going to the doctors every day. You're actively spending tens of thousands of dollars on this treatment. You're actively a participant in the process and you're convincing yourself that the ends justifies the means. Mm -hmm. And here I am convincing myself in that moment that my dad does not care about me. This is my father. I know in my heart of hearts that this man loves me. I have a lifetime of proof that he does. He's never struggled with infertility though. And here I am nailing him to the cross for what felt like to me, my experience of what he said was get over it already. And I felt like he had shot me with a bullet. And that following day, my husband, or I think it was actually the following weekend rather, my husband had another event on that weekend that he couldn't be around for. And it was, you know, in the middle of the afternoon and I was sitting in my pajamas and it was raining in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which it does a lot in the winter time. And so it was very dreary. It's like 6 PM all day long, no sunshine. And, you know, just sitting in my pajamas with my fuzzy restoration harbor blanket wrapped around me, listening to the rain, sitting in silence, crying uncontrollably. And since then, my grandmother has passed away and I had a very close relationship with her. And when I was emotionally distraught over her passing because I loved her so much. I remembered that sadness. I remembered that grief. And it reminded me of how grief stricken I was on that very day. Mm -hmm. I was inconsolable like somebody had died. Yeah. And my husband came down the steps and in that moment where I was so grief stricken, I had a thought. And we have these knives that, you know, they're like uh, the Jinsu knives, but here in with the knives that we have, they're called Kamaachi knives. And they can cut through cans, they can cut through everything. They're like, you know, the knife of the world. And I was so specific in my detail with myself that I would go to the bathroom, or I'd go to the kitchen, excuse me, I'd grab the green Kamaachi knife, which was handheld, and I would take it straight to the main artery on my thigh, and I would just drag it along that artery. And what has since been a revelation to me through work and introspection and 
getting my life coaching certification and going through therapy, finding a new therapist that I really enjoy. Was that what scared me about the moment was not that I would cease to exist, not that I would end my life, was that I was more concerned about who was going to find me and what it would do to them. What would it do to my husband? What would that leave the rest of his life like having to witness that experience? What would it do to my mom and my dad? Because they live two and a half minutes away from me. If Scott was trying to call me, who's my husband, and couldn't get a hold of me on the phone, and because I was in such a mentally unstable place at that time, and now I come to find out years later that everybody could see it, I had just made myself ignorant to the fact that these are my people. They love me so much, but of course they could see it. Of course they didn't mean to say comments that would hurt me. They just didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And so when my husband came down the steps and he asked me, what's wrong? Because I mean, I was inconsolable. And I just looked him dead in the face as if he had asked me what I wanted for dinner. And I said, I know why people kill themselves. And in that moment, he, he just stopped frozen and I could see the terror on his face that moment for me was like him looking at a complete stranger and somebody who you've been in a relationship with for a long time at that time looking at you like they didn't know you anymore Mm -hmm. was an awakening for me of everything that I had believed right looking in the mirror of I didn't recognize myself feeling like an alien inside of my body feeling like I was actually out to get me my body was out to get me and it shook me and it shocked me into this moment of clarity of everything I thought to be true was right. You are so far disassociated from yourself right now, like you do not know who you are anymore. And that was the moment where I realized that something about this has to change because now all I am is in facility. Yeah. And that's all I knew myself as. Yeah. And I, and I think that we get to that point and, and some people may not get to that point. And I only got to that point at the very end, you know, when, when it was kind of over, but really in reality no, now, I know that it, it's never over. We always have those scars, but you know, we need to get to that point of awareness where one day we will wake up and go, what happened? Like, who am I? And so you reach that point and, and And I think, you know, I'm just trying to think now in terms of the ladies who are still in the middle of this journey and they can, they resonate with bits and pieces, but they may not be to that point of awakening where they're going, I need to do something about this now. You know, you don't want them to get to that point of, of thinking about taking a knife to themselves, but they need to, you know, and, and this is the thing you, you also spoke about, you know, having compassionate responsibility and taking ownership of our situation as well. And that is really, really tough to do, you know, almost that we get to that point where, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have that victim mentality surrounding us. So how, you know, what would you How do we get out of that? What did you do to get out of that? This is happening to me. You know, I I don't know what to do anymore. Like what was the next step that you did or that you took? Yeah. So, you know, first of all, I just want to address responsibility. So it's very common that when just take for a moment to think about when anybody or someone in your life has said to you, right, they're casting it upon you, that you need to take responsibility for this. Your first guttural instinct, what is that? For those of you listening or watching right now, how does that make you feel inside your body? Because I know for me that in my life, the the experience that I had, anytime somebody was saying, you need to take responsibility for that, first and foremost, the feeling was, am I not? Their, their interpretation is, I'm not taking responsibility for that, right? Then the next thing was, I must be doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. 
So if that is your experience as well, I invite you to take in that nobody gets to tell you what you are and are not doing. This also goes back to the right or wrong context. If you make being wrong about something bad, then that's what you make it. And in comparison to that, if you make being right good, then that's what you make it. But if you decide, it does not matter if I'm right or I'm wrong, because there's something for me to glean from this either way, then that's great. That's also what you decide. Either way, whatever meaning we apply to something is the meaning that we apply to something. Next is somebody else's perspective or perception of you does not get to be right. If some, I can't tell you the number of times I've had somebody in my life tell me that I'm a bitch because I'm direct, because I say what I think and what I feel. And if somebody wants to tell me that they think I'm a bitch, I'm not going to tell them they're wrong. Mostly because I don't care. If you think I'm a bitch, that's what you think. And no matter, no amount of begging and pleading with you to not think that isn't going to change. Also, it's not my job to manage your feelings. It's not my job to manage your perspective of me. It is only my job to ascertain who I am and who I'm not. So taking responsibility for something doesn't mean you're wrong, but only if you make it. Yeah. So compassion and self-responsibility is allowing yourself to see that. I get to be an ever-growing and evolving human being. And I'm constantly saying to my husband, because he's the person in closest proximity to me because we live together, the same sentiment of I don't know who I'm going to be an hour from now, so I have no idea on how to prepare you for that. Similarly, I cannot live in the past for you. Who I was a year ago, five years ago, seven years ago is not who I am now. There may be bits and pieces of that in there, probably things that I've learned, probably lessons that I've gleaned from, but it's all wisdom, and I get to make it that. But if you're going to hold it over me like a black cloud and nail me to it, then only you are going to keep me back there. But I'm still going to be version of Shannon 2,957,366.0 that I am right now because that's who I'm committed to being. Mm -hmm. And my compassionate self-responsibility allows me to do that. It allows me to grow and change. It allows me not to be guilty of the sins of my past. And I can honor somebody's experience of whatever happened there, but I don't have to stay there. Mm -hmm. I don't have to live in that place. So what I decided in that moment when I was taking compassionate self-responsibility for myself was I don't have to nail myself to that cross and make myself awful and demonize myself for the things that I was doing as I was growing through them. I can acknowledge the people that I shut down I can acknowledge the people that I made feel small. And I can acknowledge that because I did all of that for myself. And so in that moment of compassion, self-responsibility with myself and seeing what I was doing to myself and seeing how I was hurting myself and judging myself, I allowed myself to be right. You're right. This is how you feel. You're right. That does feel bad. You're right. You're not really sure what that means. You're right. You're just trying to figure it all out. You're right. You've never gone through infertility before until now either. So it gets to be a learning experience for all of us. And I did allow myself to have conversations with my family members. And I did allow myself to say to them, I understand that the sentiment is hurt people, hurt people. But that's not who I want to be. Me? I don't want to hurt me and I don't want to hurt you. So I got to honor all of it and I got to allow myself with compassionate self-responsibility to open my eyes and see that somebody's experience of me does not define me and I don't have to make it true just because they say it is. 
I get to discern what my truth is. I get to apologize if I need to apologize. If that, if that's not who I want to be, if that was not a cute look for me, I get to own that and I get to allow myself to grow and learn from it. And that's it. Mm. And such, and that is just, that is so inspiring. That is so amazing. And I think people watching, like it's taken you quite some time. It's not like in that moment when you were, you know, huddled under your blanket that you had this epiphany and then all of a sudden you came out from underneath and went, right, this is me, this, 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 this. Like, like this has evolved over a long period of time because I, I hold empowerment days and I do coaching as well. And it's all designed to get women to this point that you are at, at least take the first step. So yeah. What were some of the first steps that you that you took to to kind of get to this point where you just you know because we all want that we all want yeah. to be able to have that that you know cone where where it just deflects and we're so confident in ourselves and who we are and we're okay to change you know like it's all about who are you and who do you want to be and you can you can be anyone but it's just a matter of you know, I guess the hardest question is who is that person? Because as you said, you know, and when we're on this journey, we lose the person that we were. And even trying to go back to the person that we were, we'll never be that person. This no. journey can make us stronger and we can, we can do so much with it, but it's really hard when you're actually sitting in it to do it. So what were some of the first things that, that you did? So I love that, right? Because as I mentioned before, I was comparing me to me. And, it, you know, you look up in psychology booklets or, you know, um, personal development booklets, and they all say the same thing, right? It's not you against the world, you against that person down the street, you against that person that's wildly successful or your mentor or your inspiration, motivation, whatever. It's you against you. But the thing that I was doing was trying to make myself her again. I was trying to get back to her. But mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is that could never fucking happen because the Shannon that was there didn't know she was struggling with stage four rectovaginal endometriosis because she didn't have the surgery to figure it out. And the fact of the matter is she didn't really understand the ramifications of what PCOS could have on her conception. Because she didn't have the, the testing and the blood work to figure it out. And she didn't have, you know, the, all the pills and the drugs and everything that she was going through. Because at that point, when I was considering suicide and contemplating how I was going to do it, I did not look like this. I was 80 pounds because I was depressed. Uh, and I didn't know I was depressed. I was refuting that and rejecting that. Like, that's for crazy people, which whatever the fuck that means. And um, I was, my hair was falling out. Like, my hair was probably about an inch thick. I had no hair. It was breaking off in droves and I developed cystic acne. I had never had acne when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. At 29 years old, full-blown acne, painful as hell, all over me. Terrible. I was not only deteriorating mentally and physically, I was determined deteriorating from the inside out. And I had become so hard to face because yes, I didn't know who I was, but physically I looked a mess. I was a wreck. So I had to acknowledge that you look like hell. Like I, and I did, I really did. I didn't, I was like, what happened to me? I'm, I'm sacrificing everything. Even though with my own eyes, I can see that I'm not well in so many ways. Forget feeling it physically. I looked it. I had to face that. I also had to, and at the time, you know, I was, I would say back then I was a much more religious person. But I was looking through, I was raised Catholic, so I was looking at how I was being raised Catholic and, and my interpretation of the way that the Bible describes the woman's purpose is to deliver life and taking that so literally and defining myself according to biblical sense and what my interpretation of it was with no room for flexibility and no room for inference, right? Of meaning that if I can't, now I'm defying my own religious self. I'm defying what God's purpose was for me. And holding myself to that biblical standard as if I'm not meeting it, I'm also failing that. I'm failing God. And holding myself to that standard as, 
you know, now I'm the devil or something. I'm something else. I don't know what the fuck I am. God gave me this body and God gave me this womb and he brought me into the world broken. And so then I was really starting to own my feelings and seeing that what scared me so much because I had such a close relationship with my religion and my grandmother, as I mentioned before, it was extremely religious and I felt connected to her through that. So now it's familial, right? Now my relationship with my grandmother is broken because now I'm also not able to satisfy what I'm told is the purpose of me. And I'm letting her down. I'm letting my parents down because now they're not going to be grandparents. I'm letting my brothers down. They're not going to be uncles. I'm letting my husband down because he will never be a father. And taking all that burden and putting it on myself. And in that moment, allowing myself to say, I have to take all of this off. And I don't know what that looks like, but I'm going to do it. And for me, it was all at once. I had to because I was suffocating under the weight of it all. And I had to allow myself to really say, how do you feel? And in that moment, I was mad. I was mad at God. I thought, smite me, I will smite you. I reject you. And I know that that seems very extreme, but it's what I needed in that moment to allow myself to take that pressure off. And so for anybody that, and if you're feeling this now and you're like, oh my goodness, I've, I've heard, you know, don't go to extremes, don't go to extremes. Trust that you can handle whatever your body and your mind and your heart is telling me that you need at that moment. And at that moment, I wanted to be pissed. And I was. Because up until that moment, I never even wanted kids. I never even wanted them. I didn't even want to get married. And there's a whole unloaded history that I have unearthed in my own experience and work and healing that I've gone through to see through to the heart of that, taking me many, many years after the fact. But in that moment, I was mad. And so I decided I'm going to be mad. I'm not going to be mad at anyone. I'm just going to allow myself to be in the presence of my mad because it was unsavory. And it was also unacceptable to the Shannon that was in control, mm -hmm. independent, a boss about her life and got shit done. Mad and anger and sad. There was no place for that shit. Because in mad and anger and sad, I felt out of control. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, allowing myself to see that I was trying to force myself to be who I'd been, which was impossible. I was up until that moment squelching my actual human emotional response and not allowing myself to be emotionally intelligent. I opened that up and let that come to the surface. Not saying it was pretty, but it happened. And, that, and that's allowed, the thing. Look, we try not to do that because we're like, what happens if I do that? If I open all of that up, we have no idea what's going to come out. And so that's why we keep that lid on so tight. So it's so brave that you just kind of like, I'm just going to let it out. And I want to speak to that for just a moment for my women who are type A, go-getters, I get shit done, I'm about my business, I'm a boss, bitch, women. <laughs> yeah. That can feel super intimidating. Because once we decide, again, you decide what right and wrong means. You decide what self-responsibility means. You decide if you're going to let someone cast aspersions on you and you make it true. You decide if you align with that. You also decide that sad and anger and any of those emotions that you decide are unsavory, you also decide if they feel like they make you out of control. Because as being about the hustle, right? We decide this is the way that needs to look. So if I freak out, if I'm pissed, that's letting my emotions control me. So I get it if you're the type A go-getter. I've been that way my whole life. You know, there, here's a list of things I'm allowed to do. Here's a list of things I, I need to get done. Check, 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 check. Now I feel good. So in the moment, if you deviate from that, then that feels unsavory. It feels unfamiliar. And I'm going to tell you something right now. That's because it is. 
right? Everything that we know and believe to be true is inside our comfort zone. And everything that has the possibility for change and transformation and growth, and you getting what you want is outside of that comfort zone. It requires us to walk outside of it and look around and go, well, this shit looks unfamiliar and is scary as fuck. And then you look back at yourself and going, well, that's because it is. Mm -hmm. And I know that that feels really like, oh, she's making this sound so easy. I make no qualms about the fact that that does sound really easy, but it's a lot of hard fucking work. Mm -hmm. And I put in a lot of time to get here. And I'm telling you this because when you come up against your self-defense mechanisms or your survival mechanisms or your automatic behaviors or things that you're familiar with. And they feel like they're challenging you to go back to the things that you know, even though you have that idea or you have that feeling or you have that energetic surge that's like, I know that I actually wanna do this, but everything's sucking me back here. It's that familiarity that's sucking you back. That feeling, that inclination, that energy, that heart-based emotional response that's you talking to you. That's you saying to you, I think, I think I have an idea of how we can move forward. You just have to be willing to engage that thought and say, you're right, this does feel weird. You're right, this does feel scary. And that is just because it's the unknown. It's something I haven't done yet. Yeah. So in, in, in that, I didn't know all this then, right? This is years of life coaching. This is therapy, like all kinds of stuff. So in that, at that time, you know, there's a lot going on about personal development books and read them and ingest them and all this stuff. So I am hip to what I'm going to want to learn from and what I'm not going to want to learn from. And this is because I'm a type A person, right? I know what I like and what I don't like. <laughs> and that still works for me, right? And I want you listening and watching to trust that. If you know what works for you, trust that. Also trust that it could change. Just know that. So at the moment, I was like, I don't want anybody to tell me how to feel. I don't want anybody to tell me that they have my number and they know who I am. I don't want that. I don't want you to be so the guy or so the girl for me. I, want, I don't want paint by numbers. I want someone that's going to talk to me real and flat. So I went upstairs and I Googled in my house. I got on my um, laptop and I Googled personal development books with swear words in them. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it doesn't get any more real than that, people. Because I was like, I cannot have someone being like, I know the way and there's only one way to do it. Because I know that's some bullshit. Because if that were true, and this is what was happening to me at the time, then I'd be pregnant by now. Because the doctors are telling me this is the way. And my body is saying, no, it ain't. So I knew that I just didn't want that. And I didn't know that I was going to find a book that was actually going to meet my needs. The universe, God, you know, rainforest, whatever the hell you believe in, gave me exactly what I needed when I was ready for it. And it was You're a Badass by Jen Sincero. Okay. And... I got this book, it came in the mail, and I feel like I read it in like 24, 48 hours. I ingested it hand over fist. And everything in this book was about, let me tell you that this is my experience. But take what you want and put yours in, in here and see what you get. I'm not saying that I know the way for you. I'm just telling you my experience. And inside of that was a lot of challenging questions. Some of that sounded like, how are you responsible for your feelings? How are you culpable for perpetuating who you are and are not being? Really, really trigger happy questions for me. And I kept reading it and rereading it because I was like, you know, fuck you, Jen Chinchero, you don't know me. And... And I found myself going back to it because she was so honest and so compassionate and made, at least in my interpretation of what she was writing, no excuses about who she was and who she wasn't. And that's actually who I'd always wanted to be my whole life. And through reading that book, I, I started to realize that oh, this is not just about infertility. 
this is the story of my life. Mm -hmm. This is who I've always been to Shannon. This is how I've always treated myself. And I've made this agreement with myself that there's no room for flexibility. There's no room for failure. And I damaged myself with that. And I found myself always looking out into the world for someone to give me an explanation or for a reason as to why things are the way they are and not allowing for the fact that sometimes things just are the way they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I love that you, that you say that because, um, you know, I guess I'm not quite sure what I'm, what I'm trying to say here, but um, just say it. <laughs> this journey while we don't want to be on there this is the perfect opportunity to dig you know and and when we when we face the most difficult things what's kind of underneath bubbles up you know and and all of a sudden you know infertility while we would never choose it i look back on my journey and think i'm so I don't know whether glad is the right word, but I appreciate the Mm -hmm. fact that I went on it because I would never be able to get to where I am right now. And I never would have done that digging and that self-reflection and that awareness without actually being on this. And a lot of people go through their whole life being completely unaware and just kind of living day for day, accepting this is who they are and just, you know, just living this ordinary life and while there's no such thing as there's nothing wrong with an ordinary life but yeah yeah but we can be extraordinary and we can be so self-aware and we can be so strong and we can we can just do so much and I really see infertility as this opportunity for us to break down and then rebuild even stronger I'm just getting chills even now thinking about it you know like it's and and while as I say, I keep on saying, we don't want to be here. We don't want to be here, but we are. And there is something that we can do. We can, we can become these amazing, amazing women. Like I, I look at you and think, oh my God, like that just blow my mind. But, but infertility got you to where you are right now. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of things that you said in there that are really impactful and potent and beautiful. And, um, you know, one of them being is we don't want to be here. (laughs) I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. I don't really have a lot of enemies, but I want to wish it on people I don't like. Right. And we were just talking about that before we started recording, you know, it's like there, not everybody is going to like everyone, but at the same time, I wouldn't wish this on somebody I didn't like because it's awful. It's really, really awful. But, you know, I didn't realize that until I got to the place of seeing who I was being and who I wasn't being because I was bypassing all of it. I was living in that narrative that you have in the doctor's offices, which is not wrong, but it's important to see what it's doing to you, is the conversation of you must keep hope, right? Because it tells you that you're not allowed to face yourself. You're not allowed to face your reality. You're not allowed to face the, I did a um, IGTV last week that I think I tagged you in, which is about the, you know, having the conversation in the process with yourself of how's your mind today? How's your heart today? How did you feel physically inside yourself today? Nobody was asking me that. It was all about show up on this date and time, we're going to give you this, we're going to use this scope, we're going to do this surgery, then you're going to leave here and you're going to have sex and HCG and progesterone that, and then we're going to wait. And then we're going to come back and we're look at your follicles, see what size they are, and then we're going to determine whether or not you're pregnant. We keep having hope. During that whole time, I wish anybody would have asked me, how does this all feel? How are you doing? Do you need to talk to somebody? Maybe somebody unbiased because, you know, you're in this process with your partner and it can feel tremendously like a lot of pressure because not only are you trying to fulfill a dream for you, you're trying to fulfill a dream for them. And that's a lot of pressure. 
Mm. And it's also a lot of pressure for your partner. You know, women are the vessel, but sometimes men get overlooked. And I know I did it. I don't, I think I wrote it in my book. I'm like, I think I wrote it in my book. I can't remember. But I think I wrote in my book, you know, the fact that I overlooked my husband. This is the most important person to me in my life. He endured this process with me. He maintained this vision of me in his heart and in his mind of this woman that he knew. And he never lost it. But I did. He held the relationship and the love for me when I went away. Because I was bypassing all of it. And I couldn't hear of the possibility of it not working out because I was supposed to keep hope. That was my job. Keep hope. Meanwhile, how do you fucking feel? Oh, I feel like shit. I'm mad at myself and I'm really not sure why because I don't want to be here. I'm feeling these negative thoughts and emotions about myself and I'm not really sure why because I didn't choose this for me. I didn't stand in line at, you know, the grocery at the deli and say, infertility, I'll take that. No. I didn't grow up trying to not get pregnant and using contraceptive and, you know, the pull out method, whatever the hell, you know, so I could grow up and then still not be able to get pregnant. I didn't err on the side of caution sexually so I could go and endure this later on. No. I don't want to loathe having sex i like sex and here i was like all right let's do it i'm gonna pull my pants down lay over the bed and then you know you do the thing and then we'll be done right i didn't want to alienate my husband and alienate my family and my friends i lost friendships in the process of this i hurt people and i had to come to terms with that and i have and i did but it's all because i didn't want to be here and I was bypassing it. Yeah. I was ignoring that. Mm-hmm. And it's an important piece and part of the puzzle that you are not a vessel. You are not broken. You are wonderful and beautiful. You just happen to be experiencing an experience that is undesirable. And it's okay if you acknowledge that. It does not mean you don't have hope that it will work out. It doesn't mean that you aren't doing everything that they're telling you to do. It doesn't mean that you are deserving of this or you did something wrong or something in a past life, which is what I thought, that I was in retribution of and trying to make up for. None of that is true. Mm -hmm. And acknowledging that and seeing that and taking responsibility for that and having compassion for that doesn't make it any less real that you would like to have your own child in your womb. Yeah. And I think it's important that And I feel like that's a gap that's missing. And I talked to therapists and other doctors about it of identifying the human in the human experience. And that's really what we're doing here, right? Mm -hmm. That's really what Jennifer brought us all together for is because if it sucks, you get to say it sucks. That doesn't make you a negative Nancy. That doesn't mean you don't want it. That doesn't mean that you aren't yearning to be a mother. And I think it's important to acknowledge, and I think I heard you say this, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, so please correct me, Jennifer, but, you know, like Jennifer and I, I decided to stop taking the fertility drugs. I decided to stop poking and probing myself. I decided to stop making my every day about, am I pregnant? Can I have a baby? And I I think, and I get that a lot. A lot of women are saying, when is enough enough? Like, when and and I think you know it, it's harder it's harder to stop than it is to keep going. So you know how do you get to that point where you're like well, enough is enough? And and and, and I I hope you don't mind me asking you this question: Are you still on your fertility journey, or have you stepped off? So I love this question for multiple reasons, right? Because it, I believe, and this is my perspective, right? Have your own perspective. I'm not casting aspersions on you or whatever you view, I believe it to be valid and true. I'll say that first and foremost, but I'm 36 years old. I'm not infertile, right? I still produce eggs. So I don't, and I don't use condoms with my husband. We don't have protected sex. So I'm still on my fertility journey because according to the doctors, after I've done all the things I've done, I should be pregnant and I'm not. So I'm still on my fertility journey and the glamorous part of having PCOS and endometriosis is that my period every month 
is never on time. So every month I get the wonderful experience of having the conversation with myself of what if this is it? What if this is my miracle baby? What happens then? Because let me tell you, you know, my life isn't planned for a baby right now. Would I be sad if we got pregnant? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, and I wrote this at my, the end of my book, you know, I feel like people ask me, hoping that my answer is going to be, I don't care anymore. It doesn't affect me anymore. And I really wish that that could be the answer. But it's not. I will always, for the rest of my life, wonder what a child between my husband and I would look like. And it will always in inspire this emotion because I love my husband. But more importantly, because I love myself and because I deserve that. I deserve to feel my baby kick in my womb. I deserve to see what it will look like. I deserve to see if it will have my attitude and his brilliance. I deserve that. We all deserve that. It doesn't mean that I'm still you know, dealing with this in a negative way, however you want to title it or dub it. But what it means is that this is a part of me. Mm. It impacted me. It changed the trajectory of my life. And I'm allowed to want those things. I'm allowed to even mentally envision what they would look like. Mm. And still hold on to hope for that. Mm. that is truly not bypassing no that's having presence with myself and presence with those emotions to allow space for them mm. in my strength and my fortitude and my decision about what that means and that's all compassionate self-responsibility mm. i love that so oh, thank you <laughs> 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 Um, thank you so much for sharing. Oh my God, that is just amazing. And, and this is something like, it just doesn't go away as well. Like I'm, I'm, I'm outside. I have two children, but still if there's this thing inside of you and it, because it's become such a habit, you know, and we have, it happens to you 12 times a year, you know, of, of that thing. And so even now, when, when I get my period, I'm like, oh, like, because it's this something that's just such a habit ingrained in us, but you know. And, and you talk about this all the time, you know, having, a, and I'm going to quote you here, you know, replace happiness on having a baby. Having a child will not make you happy. You know, having a baby adds value. It's not the sole reason that your life has any value. And you are a true testament to that. You know, you have created something outside of this and you're, you're so inspiring. So I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on here. You are like, a, I must admit, before we came on here, I was like, I said to my husband, like, oh my God, I'm such a fan. I don't know how I can do this. And he's like, do not go fangirl. Don't go fangirl. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that I've kept my cool, but I love you. I love you. I love you. And we are actually giving away five copies of your amazing book as well. And also a 30 minute mindfulness conversation with you. I might comment below as well so that I can go into the draw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I would love to. yeah. So if you want to be in the draw for that, just make sure you put a comment below. Let us know where you're tuning in from. If you're watching on the replay, just let us know that you're here and you're going to the draw. But Shannon, oh my goodness. Thank you so much for being here. I love you. You're amazing. You're such an inspiration. And, um, and yeah, it's just absolutely i love everything about you thank you so much oh thank you it was my honor and thank you all for tuning in whoever is watching like i said i can't see right now um it means a lot to me and i just want you to know my heart is with you you are strong beyond measure and at the end of the day it's something that i always say and i believe in you got to be good to yourself so be good to yourself for fuck's sake because this is your life you deserve to feel good about you in it